Hi guys, Dr. Dillard here. Let's do our embryology. It's our BSR lecture, but we're repeating embryology because we have not done well on boards in that subject. So, And you had that a long time ago, so I'm hitting the highlights of embryology. It's the summer. It's 2022. It's week three. Very tough subject, oogenesis. You, you should be familiar with this by now, but if not, here we go. Um, we actually started it last week. So where have we been? Last week we talked about, uh, of course, even going back further, oogenesis. That's the creation of the egg. We talked about spermatogenesis, which was creation of the sperm. Very easy process compared to oogenesis. Making the egg is much more complicated. So where do the eggs come from? Embryologically speaking, they really come from tissue in the yolk sac. And this tissue, or the cells of this tissue, are called primordial, uh, the primordial germ cells, if you will. They migrate out of the yolk sac, and then they start bunching up here uh, and form this uh, gonadal ridge or genital ridge um, on the gut tube. Um, and so that some of these will become the ovary, and some of them will keep, keep maturing. Uh, and the ones that keep maturing, uh, once they become big enough, they become oogonia. Oogonia, right? So primordial germ cells migrate. Some of them form an ovary, and some of them stay within the ovary and mature even further to, to become oogonia. And then we said the oogonia cells, because they were dividing by mitosis, they're piling up here by mitosis, but some of the oogonia cells, they start undergoing meiosis. And in fact, they go through, they go through interphase, no problem. Uh, in prophase one of meiosis, they, go th they cross over so that mixes all the, uh, the genes between mom and dad together. But then for whatever weird reason, meiosis stops. And they get stuck in prophase one of meiosis. And there they sit. You have, uh, you biological females have millions of cells right now inside your ovaries stuck in prophase one. And uh, we're going to build because, well, we're going to, well, let's just keep going. You'll see what I mean. All right. Uh, because crossover occurred, though, the oogonia, we're going to say goodbye to that. And we're going to call them now primary oocytes. So oogonia were very short-lived. And once crossover occurred, once they started going down the my, uh, meiotic pathway, um, they become primary oocytes. These cells and everything we've talked about so far are diploid 2N46 chromosomes each. Okay, But we've started mitosis. Remember that first, my, um, we started meiosis. Remember meiosis 1 is a reduction division. Um, so we are going to reduce the number of chromosomes. But we were, we're headed to, for that, but it stopped before we could re reduce the number of chromosomes. So they're stuck. They're still 2N46 chromosomes. Okay, what's the next thing that happens? So folliculogenesis is the next thing that happens. So we have kind of a naked, uh, we have a naked primary oocyte just sitting there and nothing protecting it. Uh, and so the next thing to happen is to grow a layer to protect it. And we're going to, uh, through a process called folliculogenesis, we're going to grow a new layer of cells uh, those cells can be uh, can be called follicle cells or follicular cells, which make up a follicular epithelium. And yeah, that front forms around the primary oocyte to protect it. So now we have a structure. Uh, we have an oocyte, a primary oocyte, and we have a layer of cells around it. And together, that gets a name. Collectively, that's called the primordial follicle primordial follicle. What is the primordial follicle? It's just the primary oocyte with a layer of cells around it. A layer of follicle cells or follicular cells. So we went from 
primordial germ cells came out of the, the yolk sac. Uh, they formed oogonia. Oogonia started meiosis and became, became primary oocytes. Primary oocytes got wrapped by a layer of follicle cells or follicular cells and became primordial follicle. See how that goes. And the primordial follicles, they're delicate. That single layer of cells doesn't do the greatest at protecting that primary, uh, the primary oocyte. So some fun fact, maybe not so fun, but some facts. By month five of development, there's about seven million primordial follicles. And for unknown reasons, they start dying and degenerating away. And by birth, 7 million is down to 2 million. Uh, so we've lost 5 million primordial follicles uh, just, through, just through the birthing or just through the process of development. And even worse, by the time puberty starts or menarche, about 11 years old, 12 or 11 years old in females, there's only 40,000 remaining. So we've lost uh, many, many, many of these things. And of the 40,000 that you start with at age 11 or 12, most of them will stay in prophase one forever. They'll never wake up and mature. Only 400 of them will ever wake up and, and race. We'll see what that means. They race to get a chance to ovulate. Uh, one will ovulate each month that will become a secondary oocyte. So the process of meiosis will start again if you're lucky enough to ovulate. And even then it gets stuck again. So you still don't finish meiosis most of the time. Only if the sperm penetrates the egg will my, the process of meiosis complete. Okay, so by 99% of these primordial follicles are lost. All right, follicular genesis, primordial follicles start waking up. So this is very strange. Um, so for, and remember, for the last 12 years, uh, the 40,000 primordial follicles in the ovaries, they are sleeping. They, they're stuck in prophase one, and they just hang out. They don't do anything. Uh, then when the menstrual cycle begins, each month, a lucky group of them, maybe 50 of them or so, um, they wake up and they start developing. And why the other thousands of them don't wake up, we don't understand how that works. Why 50? And sometimes it's not 50, sometimes it's 10. Uh, so 10 to 50 of these things wake up each month and they start developing. Uh, and I like to think of it as a great race because of the 50 or 10 to 50 that wake up, only one of them will mature the fastest and the greatest. And that one who matures the fastest and the greatest, that's the one who wins the race and will ovulate. The other ones will all perish. All right. So, uh, the great race, Larson calls it folliculogenesis, and I like that term. And remember, not all of the primordial follicles uh, are going through this each month. Uh, the 40,000 primordial follicles, most of them are just dormant still. And we don't know how, how those 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50, we don't know what wakes them up. Um, that's still kind of a mystery. All right, so yeah, we're not sure what initiates them. Uh, but we do know coming down the home stretch of the 50 that wake up or the whatever, I'm just going to say 50 for now, only three of them usually will kind of pull out from the pack, like these three horses racing. Of, there's a fourth one kind of hanging in there, but only three of them really pull out from the pack and make it to a size of 8 millimeters. In fact, when they get that far ahead of the pack, they actually destroy the rest of the field. So these three will wipe out the um, wipe out the other 47, and we'll see how that works in a second. And then only one's going to win the race. 
what drives their growth? So I try to take a lot of the crazy molecular biology out, but we should we should understand this. So primordial follicles that wake up, um, what drives their growth? Uh, it's FSH and LH. Uh, so we know how that works. Uh, each month, the hypothalamus releases gonadotropin releasing hormone, which goes down to the anterior pituitary, stimulates the release of the gonadotropins. Who are the gonadotropins? Follicle stimulating hormone FSH and luteinizing hormone LH. What do they do? Well, turns out that the that layer of cells around the primary oocyte, the follicular cells or the follicle cells, sometimes you call them granulosum cells, but I'm calling them follicular cells. Uh, it turns out that they sprout FSH receptors, um, and the sleeping ones don't. So FSH is able to bind with the racers, um, and that stimulates the race. So they start binding FSH, and maybe the three that win or come down the home stretch, maybe they have more developed FSH receptors than the other ones and are able to bind more FSH so they grow faster, uh, possibly. Um, so, yeah. So they're under the influence of FSH. And so once they start growing, you can tell they get bigger than the rest of the sleeping uh, primordial follicles. Um, and so we got to give them a new name because they look different than the sleeping primordial follicles. We just call them primary follicles. Primary follicles or primary growing follicles, they're the ones that race each month. The ones that are still sleeping, waiting their turn to maybe race next month, those are primordial follicles. Primary follicles are racing follicles. They're undergoing follicular genesis, which is the racing process. Okay, and yeah, don't forget the, the primary follicle, it still has a primary oocyte inside that's surrounded by one layer of cells, but that's about to change. Right, so here's our, uh, our racing primary follicle, and there's our primary oocyte. We said it, a layer of cells grew around it to protect it. Uh, there's our layer of follicular cells or follicle cells, this author calls it. Um, there's also a basement membrane that's important called basal lamina layer, um, which is going to be important here in a little while. Uh, and yeah, that's our racehorse right there. Um, that guy is growing. I should say that girl is growing or that thing is growing, whatever. Primary follicle is growing. All right. Continued development. Meet the zona pellucida. Oh, that's probably, you probably don't remember too much from embryology, but I bet you remember the zona pellucida. Uh, and that's because uh, that was pretty tough for the sperm to get through, right? Uh, the granulosa layer, you probably remember that. Well, let's see where they come from. Uh, and so the racing prim primary follicles, they develop a new layer. Uh, and this new layer develops underneath the follicle cells or above the primary uh, oocyte. Um, and that's your zona pellucida that forms right there. Um, and that only happens in the racing, uh, the racing primary follicles. Okay? Zona pellucida. Zona pellucida, just, and we'll get to this more next time, I think. But remember, the zona pellucida is made up of zona pellucida proteins. There's three main ones, ZP1, ZP2, and ZP3. Uh, they are glycoproteins, which are really important. ZP3 is really important because you will remember that is where the sperm binds to. Remember, the sperm has a uh, receptor called SED1, and it binds to ZP3, like this cartoon right here. There's the look into the future, even though they call it back to the future. Uh, but there's the sperm's SED1 receptor, and there's the blue ones are, this is the zona pellucida, and uh, it binds to the ZP3 receptors. So you won't get pregnant if you have a mutation in ZP3 or in SED1. There is another receptor type that can bind to ZP3 called the GAL-T receptor. It doesn't work that good, so uh, if you have a mutation in SED1, uh, males are probably going to be infertile, but there's a chance they could still have a baby because of that. 
All right, so what happens next? Follicular genesis continues. We're racing. The follicles are growing and growing and growing. After the ZP, the zona pellucida forms, the next thing that happens is that single layer of cells is not going to be a single layer of cells. They're going to proliferate uh, through mitosis, actually. Those cells divide through mitosis, and it becomes a multi-layer structure. Uh, FSH is still driving this growth process uh, of the primary follicle, but the primary follicle is going to get really big now. Let's take a look at it. Well, that's kind of jumping ahead too far. Uh, but you can see that single layer of cells is now multiple here in this picture. So remember, we had a single layer of cells. And now our uh, now we don't. Okay, uh, so we have a multi-layer structure now, and great. So membrane granulosa or stratum granulosa. So at this point, because those follicle cells are no longer single layer. It's a massive uh, multiple layer structure. We have to give it a new name. Uh, and the multi-layered follicular cells uh, is called the stratum granulosum. Stratum granulosum was just the follicular cell layer, the follicle cell layers. Because there's so many of them, we have to call it something different. And we call it stratum granulosum. Sometimes it's called membrane granulosum. Right? Um, at this point, we really shouldn't call the follicular cells follicular cells anymore. They're called granulosa cells. Granulosa cells. Some authors still call them follicular cells, so maybe not super important. But anyway, um, yeah, so now we have a multi-layered uh, uh, multi stratum granulosum here made up of granulosa cells. Uh, and yeah, once the granulosa cell reaches about eight layers thick, then a new layer of cells start forming. So this is a major event here. Specifically, they form, remember I said that basement membrane or that lamina uh, propria here? Um, so cells are now forming on the outside of that. Okay, so all these are now forming. So that's the next thing that happens. They form outside the original lamina propria uh, and this new layer collectively is going to be called the theca folliculi. Theca folliculi. So from the basement membrane here, keep saying basement membrane. It is the basement membrane, but lamina propria is another word for that. This is the theca folliculi. This is going to be really important uh, in ovulation, as we'll see. All right. The theca folliculi soon differentiates into two layers, an inner and an outer. So we have a theca interna and a theca externa. Let's look at those. Uh, the theca interna is filled with blood vessels. In fact, the cells in there secrete angiogenesis factors, which allow for the development of a, a very extensive blood, uh, kind of a capillary microcirculation type setup uh, because we have to feed those growing cells. They need oxygen and glucose and everything. So that's where that comes from. There's also fibroblasts and collagen in there as well. Um, interestingly, a lot of the cells in this layer sprout luteinizing hormone receptors, which is the first we've seen of them. Because we said LA, uh, FSH and LH were secreted, but so far they LH hasn't been used, but now it can be used. Uh, so the theca externa, that external, let's go look at that one. So this is this layer right here. You can see the smooth muscle in there. Okay, that was the interna, externa is out here. So lots of smooth muscle fiber in there. And smooth muscle, of course, has the ability to contract. And um, that's going to help kind of squeeze the oocyte. This would be a secondary oocyte at that time. Squeeze that secondary oocyte out. Um, and that's basically the egg. And the fallopian tube will kind of suck it up. And yeah, but it's got to hatch. And it hatches by smooth muscle contraction is one of the mechanisms. All right, what happens next? So next, within the stratum granulosum, we start to develop a cavity. And that cavity is called the antrum. We'll just keep it real simple, the antrum. 
that antrum will get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and pretty soon it will surround uh, this entire primary oocyte. Uh, very similar story with the chorionic cavity, which we'll talk about in a couple weeks. All right, but that's the cavity. Um, once this antrum is visible, we get another name change. So this is no longer the primary follicle. If it has an antrum, it's a secondary follicle. That's like an easy test question, isn't it? Uh, when when I can test what, if you know when a secondary follicle, what's the difference between a secondary follicle and a primary follicle? Well, it's this antrum right here. The secondary follicle will have a antrum in it. All right. So as I said, the antrum gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and pretty soon it completely surrounds uh, the primary oocyte, and it starts to create a little stalk. It doesn't completely surround it, but it creates a stalk, which is called the hillock, right? A lot of author confusion in this area. Um, but anyway, so Carlson, which is my favorite embryology book, it also says that the antrum will split the zona granulosa to, into two layers. So let's take a look at these layers here. So see how the antrum is now grown almost completely around the primary oocyte? That's the future egg there. But we have a stalk. I didn't write that in, though. But this is the stalk right here. Not this. That's, that's going to become the corona radiata, right? Because we have a zona pellucida in red here. And this is going to become the corona radiata. That's called the cumulus ophorus. Cumulus ophorus, note card. What's the what's the genesis of the corona radiata? Who's the parent cells of the corona radiata? Cumulus ophora cells. Uh, the, these cells down here, that's just part of the stalk. Okay. Um, then this layer out here, so we have an inner layer. We've we've split that granulosa layer into an inner layer, cumulus ophorus, and then we have an outer layer right here. Okay, that's called the mural granulosa cells um, or the mural granulosa layer. Okay, let's see. Is that wrong? Yeah, that's wrong. Okay, watch out for that one. I'm going to have to fix that. It's the cumulus ophorus that becomes the corona radiata. So I just caught that mistake. Okay, so fix that mistake, and I will fix it. All right. So cells immediately surrounding the, the primary oocyte, cumulus ophorus, will ultimately get uh, ejected with the oocyte, and that will be the corona radiata. So it's correct right here. And it says this will become the corona radiata right here. All right. So only one wins the race. So we're racing, and we're racing, we're racing. Around day 14 or so, there's three that have gotten really, really big. Three primary follicles. Actually, we're secondary follicles at this point. Uh, but three have gotten much, much bigger. Uh, but only one of these will win the race and be able to ovulate. The others will degenerate away. So the question is, how do the big three survive and not the others? Well, the big three eventually don't need FSH anymore. They become FSH dependent. Remember, FSH is fueling the growth of all the racers, all the 50 racers. Uh, but the big three don't need it at, at, when they get to a certain point because they secrete their own estrogen, which will keep them going. Uh, and when they do, they secrete a hormone, those big three, all of them, called inhibin. An inhibin will get into mom's bloodstream and it'll temporarily shut off pituitary FSH secretion for a while. And when that gets shut off, the ones that are still FSH dependent, well, they run out of gas and they die. They degenerate away. So it, they basically kill everything off. So 24-hour clock. In 24 hours here, we're going to have ovulation. So the largest follicle, once it reaches about 10 millimeters in size, it's going to get a new name. It's called the graphene follicle. 
graphene follicle. Sometimes it's called the mature follicle, sometimes the tertiary follicle, because we had a primary and secondary. Uh, but graphene follicle is the most common. Within 24 hours, this graphene follicle uh, will have bound to the inner surface of the ovary, uh, and it'll release its payload. At that point, it'll be the secondary oocyte into the fallopian tubes. So let's see how that works. So about day 14, uh, we get another surge of FSH. Uh, so oh, there's only three that are left because the other ones died off because FSH was not secreted. Now FSH is secreted again. And this is called the, the ovulatory surge. And this surge stimulates the graphene follicles primary oocyte to resume meiosis one. I mean, it's usually only the biggest follicle of the three undergoes this process. Uh, and it's actually luteinizing hormone is the one, remember I said they sprouted uh, LH receptors? It's the luteinizing hormone that really kicks this into gear. And, and I cut a lot of this, it's getting way too complicated, but FSH is involved again. Okay, uh, remember what meiosis 1 created. So we're going to finish meiosis 1. Uh, and so that primary oocyte will, it's a reduction division, it'll split. It'll split into a new primary oocyte, but we're going to call that the secondary oocyte, and it's, which steals all the cytoplasm during the split. It's not an equal split. And it steals all the cytoplasm, and its brother is just called the first, or its brother, sister, or whatever, uh, it's called the first polar body because it doesn't have enough cytoplasm to really be viable. So it's kind of a dead thing. So even though we split our primary oocyte into two parts, really we only get one functioning part, and that's called the secondary oocyte. Okay, and then remember, meiosis 1 is completed now, so we have a reduction division. Each one of these is going to have half the genes uh, of the original primary oocyte. Um, so this is 1N23 chromosomes, 1N23 chromosomes. So each one of these is haploid, has 23 chromosomes. The primary oocyte was 2N46 chromosomes. Let's go look and see how this works. So gonadal surge happens. Uh, and it goes in, and remember, prophase one, we were stuck here for many, many, for many, many years. Uh, but it wakes up now, and only in the winter, only in the biggest graphene follicle does this happen. But it goes through meiosis one, so it goes into metaphase one, um, anaphase, where they pull away, telophase, uh, and then cytokinesis. But this drawing is really wrong because this is our secondary oocyte, and that has all the cytoplasm. The polar body shouldn't have any cytoplasm, and therefore it's not functional. Okay, and we're gonna and we're gonna keep going. We're gonna start metaphase, or we're gonna start prophase two, and this time we're gonna get stuck in metaphase two, again. But I got ahead of the slide, so yeah, stuck again. Koala bear's got his head stuck. So after going through prophase two, the graphene follicle secondary oocyte gets stuck again, and we don't know why, but it does. Uh, but this time it doesn't get stuck in prophase two. Remember, it got stuck in prophase one. Now the secondary oocyte gets stuck in metaphase two, and it never finishes, and it probably won't. The only time it'll ever finish meiosis two is if a sperm fertilizes it, which we'll look at next week. Okay, let's get this thing hatched. So our graphene follicle is way ahead here. The other ones have all died off. Um, so about day 14, uh, the hillock of the cumulus ophorus, remember this was the future corona radiata. We're calling it, we're not calling that yet. It's a cumulus ophorus. Uh, but here's the stalk. The stalk dissolves away. And now this thing is loose and it's starting to float around in here. Um, and then the cells of the cumulus ophrys start secreting a hyaluronic acid rich uh, extracellular matrix, which starts binding water. It starts sucking water in from the outside, 
which is going to make this thing swell like crazy. Plus, it's very slippery. The hyaluronic acid uh, makes this slippery so this thing can squirt out. This is the egg, remember. This is the container for the egg. This is what's going to get fertilized. We're leaving this whole thing behind. Okay? And yeah, because of that water coming in, uh, thing expands to 20, almost doubles in size, to 20 millimeters the graphene follicle gets. Um, and it, um, yeah. So that also is going to put pressure. If you swell this thing up with water, it's going to want to burst, uh, which we want it to do because we got to get that thing out. And we got to burst right through the ovary wall too. So that's easier said than done. Uh, Larson calls that uh, cumulus expansion. Okay, so let's get this thing hatched. So in order for hatching to occur, what do I mean hatching? I mean this has to be shot out, not only out um, of the graphene follicle, but it has to be shot right out of the ovary. So how do we make that, how do we make that happen? Well, we have to break down the follicular wall. Um, so and the pressure is helping, but it's not enough. So we need to get an inflammation uh, started, which will damage the wall and weaken it. And so uh, a bunch of histamine and prostaglandins are released uh, from the blood vessels of that theca folliculi. Um, and that starts to damage the wall uh, of the graphene follicle. Um, and it makes it sticky, so it sticks to the inner wall of the ovary because of this inflammation. In fact, you can see when it's stuck to the wall, here's an endoscopic view of somebody about ready to ovulate, and there it's stuck to the wall, um, and we have an inflammation right here. It's actually knocked out the tunica albigenia of the ovary is because there's a wicked inflammation here, um, and this thing is going to be bursting out of here. This bump seen on the outside has a name that's called the stigmata, or sometimes the follicular stigmata. All right, so what finishes it off? So we got an inflammation wearing down the wall of the graphene follicle and wearing down the ovarian wall. It's getting very thin, ready to break. Uh, so what happens next? Uh, well, that smooth muscle, remember that smooth muscle in that outer layer of the, thick, of the uh, graphene follicle? Um, that's going to start contracting, and it's going to squeeze the secondary OSI outward uh, toward the wall of the already damaged ovary. There's also some enzymes. I took all those out because I don't think we need to know those, but there's enzymes that have been released which further break down the graphene follicle wall and ovarian wall. And finally, because of the squeezing of that muscle, where's that muscle there? Where's that picture? Let's look at that. Oh man, I'm going way back, aren't I? There it is. This muscle layer right here is the one that's squeezing. Uh, so the part that's damaged from the inflammation doesn't do anything. But everything else squeezes and pushes the, pushes the secondary oocyte that way. Okay, now i got to be careful not to go too far. I guess I could have put a, put a picture in there. All right, so now we got the secondary oocyte hatched. It's ovulation has occurred and the race is over. What happens next? Uh, so there is the uh, there is the secondary oocyte. It's the fimbriae of the fallopian tube will come down over that stigmata area and there's little tiny uh, cilia that will sweep and kind of suck that egg inside the fallopian tube. Sometimes it gets loose though, right? Sometimes you can have an ectopic pregnancy. But most of the time, it's a pretty efficient process. Uh, the secondary oocyte gets sucked into the egg by the fimbriae. All right, now this is important too. Uh, so what happens to the graphene follicle that just shot out its secondary oocyte? Now it's just kind of a dead bag of cells, right? No, it actually is very, very important. Um, those granulosa cells will morph, and we, I cut all those slides out. We don't need to know that, but the 
granulosa cells have morphed into a new cell type after ovulation occurred, uh, and they become luteal cells. And the luteal cells have kind of repopulated and taken over that dead graphene follicle. Uh, that dead graphene follicle now gets a new name, and it's called the corpus luteum. Who was the corpus luteum? It was the graphene follicle, kind of the dead um, oocyte-less graphene follicle. And it's an endocrine structure because it secretes some major hormones. It secretes estrogen. Those luteal cells secrete estrogen and progesterone like crazy. Um, the, and these progesterone stimulates the endometrium to thicken and become vascular in preparation for uh, a fertilized egg to implant there. Okay, it's got to get ready just in case it, it, the fertilization occurs the endometrium has to be ready for that, and that's accomplished uh, by the release of, of progesterone. All right, if the fertilization and plantation occurs, corpus luteum, or if the fertilization fails, an implantation fails, then the corpus luteum will die. Uh, we will learn probably next week or the week after uh, where human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG, will be secreted uh, by the fertilized egg. And that will keep corpus luteum alive. But if that doesn't happen, there's no HCG. And so the corpus luteum degenerates into a dead sack of tissue. That dead sack of tissue is called the corpus albicans. So make note cards of these words. What's corpus abacans? Uh, it's a dead corpus luteum. Or that's where it came from. Where did corpus luteum come from? That kind of came from the dead graphene follicle. See how that works? All right. Well, that's enough. This was a complex topic, so but it is board favorite stuff, so you got to know that stuff. Um, here's our bird of the day. This is a northern harrier. Uh, and very cool bird. I don't see this. I've only seen this. Actually, this is the only picture I have of it. I've seen all kinds of birds of prey, but I don't see that. That was shot over by Kirby Park over in uh, by Moss Landing. And I'll see you guys later.